Oh, good morning, protege, or of course, good afternoon to my wonderful and only afternoon class. Hey, I hope this direct instructional Zoomcast finds you well. So this is going to be my direct instruction for Tuesday. It's two for Tuesday, two for Tuesday. I say double the pleasure. You say double the fun. And this is December 7th, 2021. This is, by the way, the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, by the Empire of Japan. This was the event, the incident that ushered in the United States entrance into World War II, the sequel to World War I, which we are studying right now. All right, let's get into it, shall we? You guys know the drill. So I'm gonna share my screen with everybody. So at this point, everybody should have already gone and dated your notes in the top right-hand corner. Remember, it's a new day. It's a new date. It's a new page, okay? Remember, there's going to be times I'm going to be going a little quickly, and that's okay. You guys have done a great job. I like the way you're pausing these Zoom casts. Again, this is not a race to finish first. It's a race to do well. And the other thing is, again, I want to reiterate, even though, again, you guys are doing a great job with writing down the main bullet notes, you've got to be now adding more oral notes and clarifying and explaining those bullet notes. Then we're getting, we're taking you guys to that next level of note taking. All right. So in our last Zoom cast or my last Zoom cast, I had taught you or I had introduced the battles of, Ver of Verdun and the Battle of the Somme. So I'm going to come back to Verdun in a moment. Because what, in order to understand those two significant battles in 1916, I said those are your quintessential, seminal, again, World War I trench style of battles, trench warfare style of battles. So I think it's important that before we get more into Battle of Dunn and the Battle of the Somme, you got to know more about trench warfare, which is what really makes World War I incredibly insidious. So on the top line, I want you to write down for me, World War I, the sounds of battle. So the first thing we're going to do is, as we under, try to come to uh, understand what exactly was trench warfare, what I want everybody to do is I'm going to play a video clip for about, about four minutes long. And in this video clip, you are going to see some images, some photographs, some illustrations. And at the same time, there's going to be sound effects in the background. It's supposed to replicate, again, the sounds of fighting and trench warfare. So as you're watching this video for the next four minutes, I want you to be taking notes on what you're seeing and what you're hearing at the same time. This is supposed to, again, give you a chance to use your imaginations and try to imagine what it was like fighting in a trench at Verdun in 1916 or the Battle of, of the Somme in 1916. Here we go.
Pretty disturbing. This is going to be an incredibly disturbing direct instructional Zoom cast in terms of the horror of war, especially this one in World War I. So to kind of summarize and dovetail back again, some of the images in terms of the soldiers' faces, you know, it's, it's personalizing it. But secondly, you listen to the sounds in the background, the screaming, the gunfire. What were some of the weapons that you picked up on? What do you notice that this gentleman's wearing right here? It's called a gas mask. All right, let's get into it. So ladies and gentlemen, again, in previous years before the pandemic, we would do this whole elaborate, tre elaborate trench warfare experiential, but because of the pandemic, we we're going to have to do a modified version of it. All right, so here we go. So ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. You're going to use your imaginations. It's 1916 and you are fighting along the Western Front. The sad reality is the vast majority of you are not going to be coming back home alive at this point. In 1916, if you were at Verdun or the Battle of the Somme or another significant battle in terms of World War I and trench warfare, there's a very good chance that four, one of four things are going to happen to you. Either you're going to be killed in action on the battlefield on what's called no man's land. You could be wounded on the battlefield. Good luck trying to get somebody to help you. There's a very good chance you're going to end up dying from your injuries. You could become a prisoner of war and never return back to your home. Or you could be missing in action. You're unaccounted for. We don't know what happened to you. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to now do is I'm going to share with you a series of photographs. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I want you with every photograph, I want you to study it. I want you to pause it. Take about a minute per photograph and I want you to describe for me what you see in this photograph. These are all photographs that tie in with the horror of World War I. So this should take you about approximately five minutes to do. Now, in addition, there is one photograph that I've intentionally inserted. It was taken during World War I, but you see a theme with these photographs. One of the photographs does not fit into this theme. You have to figure out which one it is. Are you ready? So here we go. All's quiet on the Western Front. Photograph number one, describe what you see. Pause, take about a minute. I'm gonna continue on. Photograph number two, pause the Zoom cast, take about a minute, describe what you see. Photograph number three, pause the Zoom cast, describe what you see. Next photograph, pause the Zoom cast, take about a minute, Describe what you see. Next photograph. Pause the Zoom cast. Describe what you see. Next photograph. Pause the Zoom cast and describe what you see. Next photograph. Pause the Zoom cast, describe 
what you see. Next photograph. Pause the Zoom cast and describe what you see. Next photograph. Pause the Zoom cast and describe what you see. Have you figured out which of the photographs do not belong? Oh, it was taken in World War I, but you see a constant theme throughout those photographs. Do you know which photograph doesn't belong, doesn't fit into the theme? Let's continue on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please write this down. So trench warfare. So what's a trench? So your typical dugout trench. Remember, as a result of the Battle of the Marne in 1914, both sides now realize they are mired in what's called a stalemate. Neither side is strong enough to decisively defeat the other. So instead of fighting an offensive war, both sides, the central powers and the allied powers are gonna be fighting what's called a defensive war. Then you add in the fact, not only are they fighting defensively, but the weapons are far more sophisticated and far deadlier than what you would have seen, say going back to the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 or America's Civil War, 1861. So a typical trench was about six to eight feet deep and the six to eight feet wide. So it was deep enough so you'd be able to walk across the walk through the trench, it's not across it, but through it without your head protruding up. Because if your head is sticking up above ground, there's a good, very good chance you're going to get your head shot off. Now, what you're going to also see with typical trench warfare, you have your main trenches in the front, which I'm going to share an illustration with you shortly. But then you're going to also notice there's going to be some support trenches that are going to run behind the main trenches for both the central powers and the allied powers. Now, what were the support trenches for? So the support trenches would be for things like communications. You know, that's where you're going to be disseminating the order to the soldiers to go what's called over the top, which I'll talk about later on. You would also have support trenches that would be for supplies, limited food, some medicines, no penicillin in those days. Penicillin is still another 20, 25 years into the future. So if you, again, get an infection through an injury or a wound, there's a very, very, very good chance you're going to end up getting a really bad case of gangrene. And as you learned about in the Civil War, the only solution was amputation, cutting it off. And they had, again, some limited trenches for medical care. But again, the medical care, folks, in 1916 was primitive, even when you compare it to what you would find in World War II or the Korean conflict or the Vietnam War slash conflict. So if you direct your attention up to my, again, screen, this is a great illustration that again shows you what trench warfare looks like. So let's just suppose that over here, we're gonna call this the central powers and over here would be the allied powers. So here's your main trench right here. All your soldiers are here. Here's your allied soldiers. And then over here would be your central powers. We'll get to this part here shortly. And then back over here, this is where you're gonna have your support trenches, your communications trenches, your medical trenches. And then way back over here, that's where you're going to have your heavy artillery, your big Berthas, as we learned about in our previous video that I shared with you on the Battle of Verdun. All right, let's continue on. Please write this down. So what's going to happen is barbed wire was used to protect the frontline trenches from an enemy attack. So again, I'm going to pick the pace up a little bit. If I'm going too quickly, pause the video. So this would be the barbed wire that would be set up in front of the main trenches. And so if the enemy somehow was able to make it across an area called no man's land, you would become entangled in this. It's like a spider's web, except this spider's web is not sticky per se. It's got short spikes that are in the metal and you would get your clothes caught up in there. You would get entangled in it and it would be very easy then for the soldiers on the opposite side of the barbed wire to basically, um, I'm going to be blunt, eliminate you. So the area that we call between the main trenches was called no man's land. You definitely need to write this down because that's where your main fighting is going to transpire. So if you direct your attention again up to my screen top, 
This is the area right here that was called no man's land, right here. It was called no man's land. You should draw a line off to the side because no soldier wanted to be there. You didn't want to be caught there alive or again, sadly, dead. So no man's land actually varied in size in terms of how big it is. The bigger the battle, like the Battle of Verdun or the Battle of the Somme, those are your really huge, big, seminal, quintessential, again, trench warfare style of battles, they're going to be a much bigger area. So a smaller battle, the area right here, no man's land, could be about 25 yards, 25 to 30 yards. But the bigger battles, like a Verdun or the Battle of the Somme, it would literally be one mile to get from your main trench across no man's land to your enemy's trench. Good luck trying to make it across while you're carrying all this heavy equipment and your clothes are waterlogged. And again, you've got machine gun fire coming at you at all angles. So what would happen is you would be in your main trench right here. If you're the allied powers, your main trench right here, you of course would be your central powers. And the signal would be given by your commanding officer and was called going over the top. That was the signal that most soldiers know all soldiers dread it. Because what's going to happen is when your commanding officer, whether they're saying it in English or French or German, said go over the top, what you would have to do is you would have to very carefully somehow climb out of this six to eight foot deep trench. And you'd have to get out of your trench and you'd have to make it somehow across no man's land trying to get up through. Here's your barbed wire here and here. So if you're coming from here, you're not only trying to get across no man's land, but you're going to have to get through this barbed wire here to get to your enemy's trench right there. All I will say to you is good luck. And if you direct your attention up to the overhead screen, this is a photograph of a group of British soldiers. They have been given the orders to go over the top. They've climbed out of their trench now, and they have to somehow meander their way across no man's land, whether it's, again, 25 to 30 yards or one mile. All I'm going to say to you is, Good luck trying to get to the other side. So the goal, it's real simple. So when the soldiers climbed out of their trench to run across no man's land, again, you would have what's called fixed bayonets, or they would make use of what's called hand grenades. So if you direct your attention up to my laptop screen, this is an example of a World War I hand grenade. It's a small handheld bomb. It almost looks like an unripened small avocado or even a small pineapple. So if you direct your attention up to my laptop screen, these British soldiers are taking the hand grenades and you're kind of throwing it like a baseball, but it's more like a shot put. And you're trying to throw it into your enemy's trench. And once it landed, the thought process, the goal was for this hand grenade to blow up and it would basically eliminate everybody in that trench. The goal was simple. Your goal was to somehow get across no man's land and your goal was to make it all the way to the other side. Now, if you direct your attention up to the, again, my laptop screen, these are British soldiers and this is called fixed bayonet. So I would draw a line off to the side. You wanna clarify this in just your oral notes. So the bayonet is right there. It's on the end of the rifle. I would describe it as a long knife, a small sword. And so what you would try to do is if you could somehow get into your enemy's trench, you would try to use the bayonet to try to impale or stab your opponent. It was just a very bloody, brutal style of fighting. All right, if you would please write this down. So as we get more into the casualties, of, again, when we get into the Battle of Verdun and the Somme, and I always teach those two battles just to, for you to understand the size and magnitude of these battles. And by the way, no other battle really accomplished much. Stalemate still continued on. The war's going to drag on for two more years. But wait till you hear the staggering number of casualties. And one of the biggest reasons why the casualties were so exponentially higher in World War I is even compared to as bloody as the Civil War was. I go back to Gettysburg, over 50,000 casualties in, again, three days of fighting. And that, but that's combining the Union and the Confederacy. Wait till you hear the casualties when we talk about that done in the Battle of the Somme. The other thing is, You've got weapons now in World War I that are far deadlier and far more sophisticated than what you would have witnessed at, say, Antietam in 1862 or Gettysburg in 1863. So, for example, the flamethrower. So the first time you saw a flamethrower, ironically, is the battle that I'm going to be teaching you about more in the video, and it's called the Battle of Verdun, fought in 1916. 
And the flamethrower was actually introduced by the Germans at this battle. So basically, you have this long hose with a backpack, and it would shoot out a long spray of fire, ostensibly, to try to burn everything inside a trench if you were able to get closer enough. By the way, the flamethrower, you should draw a line off this side. This is not a, a, a new invention, per se. The Romans were experimenting with flamethrowers over 2,000 years ago. Tanks. Tanks were also introduced during World War I. And if you direct your attention to the overhead screen, this is an example of a German tank in World War I. In World War II, they're going to look very, very different. This is a German tank because that's the German Iron Cross. And what's interesting was the tank was not a German weapon. It was a British weapon that was introduced at the Battle of the Somme. Now, I would draw a line off to the side to clarify this. this the, the early tanks of the Battle of the Somme were not very effective. They kept breaking down on the battlefield. But both the Brits and the Germans saw the potential of tanks. So for two years, both sides worked on perfecting the tanks, got rid of all the bugs and the kinks that was causing it to break down. And by 1918, you should make a little side oral note, the tank was so effectively used by late summer of 1918 that it basically it eliminated trench warfare. And it introduced a, a style of fighting that you're going to see more so when we get to World War Two, but we'll worry about that later on. So I want to share with you some other weapons of mass destruction. And again, keep in mind that these weapons were, again, these deadly 20th century modern weapons. The problem was, and I would draw a line off to the side to add this as a side note, too many of the officers on both sides, the Central Powers and the Allied side, they still thought they were fighting a 19th century war. They still thought they were fighting in the Franco-Prussian War. This is not the Franco-Prussian War. The Franco-Prussian War was fought almost 50 years earlier. And the bottom line is, by the time you get to World War I, you're still thinking you're fighting a 19th century war using 20th century weapons. You add the two together, it equals high casualties. So one of the deadliest weapons that was introduced in World War I was called poison gas. Poison gas was actually introduced by the Germans at the Battle of Ypres in 1915. So if you direct your attention up to the overhead screen, remember at the beginning of the vid of this Zoom cast and I shared that video of the sounds, the sights and sounds of World War I, and I pointed out the cursor, these guys are wearing bath gas masks. If you look around them, there's a cloud. That cloud is poison gas. So there were two types of gas that was introduced in World War I. One was called chlorine gas, and one was called mustard gas. And it was the mustard gas in particular that was the deadliest. If you were exposed to these gases, again, you're, you're breathing it in, you're getting in your eyes. Without the gas mask on, then you should draw a little side note over here. It could cause permanent damage to your eyes. Many guys were blinded as a result of exposure to poison gas. They didn't understand the importance of wearing a gas mask at this point at Ypres. Or if you breathe enough of it into your lungs, it would literally burn and destroy the tissue of your lungs and would permanently scar you for the rest of your life. But the weapon that caused the most casualties, and by the way, poison gas, you should also make a little side note about this. Poison gas is the only weapon after World War I that was banned. It was not allowed to be used in World War II. But the weapon that was proved to be the most deadly of World War I, this is the one, big one. I would make a little side note about it, and it was called the machine gun. So the machine gun back in 1916 had the ability, these two British soldiers are manning one machine gun right here. That single gun could fire anywhere from 400 to 600 rounds of bullets a minute. So you'd have all these guys running across no man's land as they got closer and closer and closer to the enemy trench. Then all of a sudden the machine gun would start spraying bullets everywhere across no man's land. And if you weren't killed, there's a very good chance you were simply wounded. Very few guys were able to make it across. And finally, another weapon, it really wasn't a weapon, as we know, it was an invention by the Wright brothers. I don't think they were too thrilled about this, but the airplane. So this is an example of you direct your attention up to my laptop screen. That is an airplane in 1917. Airplanes were used primarily, there were dogfights, air fights up in the sky between the German air uh, pilots, Air Force pilots, and say the British, French, and later on American. And it won't be until World War II that the use of airplanes will change as compared to World War I. In World War II, airplanes will be used more to attack the enemy on the other side of the battlefield. 
But in World War One, excuse me, more of these dog fights, these fights up in the sky. So even warfare, again, a good example of how warfare is going to change in a relatively short period of time, about 20 years. So if you would please write this down. So life in the trenches. So the average soldier fought in those main trenches anywhere from about three days until about seven days. And what would happen is after about three to seven days, then you would rotate and you would go to some of those, again, those support trenches way in the back where you would try to get some rest and relaxation. Good luck because in the back, that's where your heavy artillery was. And you would hear this going on nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't know how anybody would be able to sleep with all those incredible, that, that sound and noise that's going on. So when you fought in a trench in World War I, and as horrible as World War II was, and it was bad, statistically more soldiers died in World War II than World War I. But as I keep saying again and again, there is something incredibly insidious about trench warfare. So what were some of the biggest obstacles living in those trenches? Number one, you saw this at the beginning of my Zoom cast. I pointed it out a couple of times. Trench foot, flooded trenches. So remember, you're in this hole that's six feet deep. And again, it starts to fill with bloody water, muddy water. Again, body, body waste as well. All of this, you're basically standing in a sewer. And the boots that these guys were wearing were not waterproof. So they would end up what's called trench foot. You're exposed to water too long. And eventually trench foot could lead to an infection. There's no penicillin in those days. And if you had a bad case of trench foot, you could potentially have your feet amputated, cut off like they did in the Civil War. Dead bodies. That was another problem with living in the trenches. There, was no, there weren't opportunities frequently to get rid of the dead bodies. So there you were living in your trench with decomposing bodies. I worked in a cemetery when I was in college my freshman year. And I have to tell you, the smell of a decomposing body, it's a smell you never forget. It is absolutely mind boggling. It's numbing. And can you imagine being around all these dead bodies that are decomposing and you're standing in water in a trench that's filled with mud and it's filled with blood and decomposing bodies and bodily waste. If you get my drip, this is a really incredibly challenging and I'm going to be blunt, disgusting situation. And the biggest thing that the soldiers dreaded, of course, were the rats. The rats, the rats, the rats were everywhere, swimming in the water in the trenches, gnawing at your, your decomposed bodies of, the, of, the, of your comrades who had fallen in battle. Faces would be ripped apart. It was just, again, an incredibly challenging time. So I'm going to share a scene with you guys from a very famous movie. It was called All's Quiet in the Western Front. It was made in 1930. So this is three years after talking movies were introduced back in 1927. And what's really, again, interesting about this movie, by the way, they remade it in 1979. Um, again, this movie was made basically 12 years after World War I had ended. And considering this is the beginnings of movie making, the realism in this movie is unbelievable. So in this scene I'm going to share with you guys, this is Paul. So if you read the book, All's Quiet in the Western Front, which I highly recommend you read, it's coming from the perspective, not of the allied powers, the Brits, the French, and later on the Americans, but from the German point of view. You know, World War I is different than World War II. In World War II, there was clearly a bad guy, and that was the Nazis. They had to be stopped. But World War I, you can't say that the allied powers were the good guys, and you can't say the Germans were the bad guys, and vice versa. It was grayer, and that's what makes it more complex. Again, you go back to the causes of the Great Depression. Let me rephrase that. The causes of World War I nationalism, imperialism, system of alliances, and militarism. And in all four of those factors, both sides were guilty of it. So to sit there and affix blame on one side and say, we're right, you're wrong, that's not the case. World War II, that's a different story. So Paul, this young soldier here, a German soldier, he's told when in 1914 to fight for the fatherland and that war was glorious and you would come back to your village and you would be, again, have medals of honor and pretty girls would be greeting you and kissing you on the cheek and so on and so forth. And as Paul finds out, like a lot of soldiers, whether you're German or you're British or you're French and later on American, you discover that fighting in war is not glamorous. It's not glorious. It is horrible. 
as Paul's going to find out right now. Here we go. So these are French soldiers jumping over the trenches. Watch what happens. So to finish that scene, so Paul, the German soldier, had stabbed that French soldier. And at that point, he came to a realization that this French soldier really wasn't any different than him. Different side. He was told he's the enemy. And Paul goes on to say, you could have been my brother. And what eventually happens in that scene is that French soldier dies. And Paul, at that point is written with tremendous remorse, guilt. He actually finds at one point in the French soldier's pocket, a photograph of his wife and his daughter. And then Paul basically um, says, I'll take care of your family for you. And he begs his forgiveness. Later on, Paul goes back to Germany and he meets his former teacher, then the teacher had espoused, you know, the glory of war and fighting for the fatherland. And Paul looks at the teacher and he basically says, war was, is not glorious. It's not glamorous. And by the way, not to give it away, because I would highly recommend you consider reading the book, All's Quiet in the Western Front, or watching the entire movie. I would do the early version, 1930. Um, Paul eventually is killed. All's Quiet on the Western Front. All right, here's what I need you to do. I want you to skip a full page. I want you to go to the right side of the next clean sheet of paper. Once again, I'd like you to date your notes for December 7, 2021. So what I want to do now is I want to finish up the Battle of Verdun. I'm going to share a video clip with you, and then we're going to wrap up this very somber, very disturbing, very depressing celebration of learning. All right, so I'd like you to write this down. So it's February. And the year is 1916. So now everybody has a much better perspective of when we talk about trench warfare. You should have a better understanding what trench what, what trench warfare entailed and encompassed. Again, Verdun, 
Somme, quintessential trench warfare style battles. So in February 1916, the Germans go on the, uh, the offensive and attack Verdun. Now remember, the German commander was Erich von Falkenhayn. I introduced him with my lax Zoom cast, and he is waging what's called the War of Attrition. They're going to be mentioning this in the video clip I'll be sharing with you shortly. So where exactly is Verdun? So Verdun is this ancient medieval French village. The French have a very special, powerful, spiritual, almost a religious connection with Verdun. Verdun is almost as important as its capital, which is Paris. So Verdun is about 125 miles due east of the capital of France itself, and that, of course, is Paris. So if you direct your attention up to my map, this, of course, is all of France. Here's Paris right there. There's the capital. And there's Verdun, located up in the northeastern part of France itself, pretty close to the border right there between France and then Belgium to the northeast. So what I want you to do is I want you to skip a full page. I want you to go to the right side of the next clean sheet of paper. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you a video clip. So I want you to write down for me, once again, date your notes, top right-hand corner. It's December 7th, 2021. And I'm going to share with you some guide questions on the Battle of Verdun. Now, I, pr I may not be able to finish all the battle itself in terms of summarizing its importance, but I definitely want to share with you this video clip. Because again, now that you have a better understanding and perspective of what trench warfare is or was, now you're going to have a greater perspective and understanding what Verdun was. All right, so here we go. Guide question number one. So at the beginning of the clip, what was German commander Erich von Falkenhayn's goal at Verdun? So again, I'm going to go through these guy questions relatively quickly because you guys can, can pause the Zoom cast to allow yourself to catch up in writing the entire question down. Remember to skip a couple lines between each guy question. Two, I want you to cite any stats. Again, like for example, how many deaths per minute? How many shells were fired during a four-month period of time? It's not, again, that I'm going to ask you a question like how many deaths occurred per minute at Verdun, but I might include these stats in as a context clue or as part of an answer choice. So anytime you hear statistics, write it down. It's great support. Number three, what eventually caused the destruction at Verdun? This is an ancient medieval French village that was over 800 years old. It had survived centuries, but it didn't survive what happened had been done the battle. I want you to tell me about what things, how things were going in World War I for Germany in 1916. In other words, were they winning the war at this point? Were they losing the war at this point based on the video clip? Next guy question, and this is a really important one. Why did the Germans target Verdun? There, it ties in with Erich von Falkenhayn's a very dark and sinister war of attrition. There's a connection with it. Why Verdun? Why not again go back after Paris as they did in 1914 with the Battle of the Marne? And then also, what was German commander Erich von Falkenhayn's aim at Verdun? What was he hoping to achieve? What was his goal? All right, so ladies and gentlemen, this is a long video clip. It's actually 47 minutes long. No, we're not watching 47 minutes. We're going to watch about a little over five minutes of this video. And again, giving you now greater perspective. You've learned about trench warfare and the horror of war in World War I, but now you're going to learn more about how it actually applies to a specific battle, the Battle of Verdun. The battle unleashed by German General Erich von Falkenhayn in February 1916 was extraordinary, in that his only goal was to kill, not to capture ground. The fighting prompted acts of extraordinary heroism and also prompted slaughter on a terrifying scale. Very nearly one death per minute, night and day, for the entire 10-month duration of the battle. Verdun became a symbol of the French will to resist, and what happened here determined the course of the war. Ninety years on, for many French men and women, Verdun still has an iconic significance. But what bearing does it have on that titanic struggle which looms so large in British history? The Battle of the Somme, which began in July 1916, 
In my view, it is impossible to understand one without studying the other. That's why I'm going to teach both. How was it that the Battle of Verdun led inexorably to hundreds of thousands of British casualties on the Western Front? I mean to cast a soldier's eye on the strategy and tactics of these huge battles, to offer a glimpse inside the minds of the generals who fought them. From February to December 1916, Verdun became the most heavily bombarded place on earth. To me, these pictures suggest Berlin, Hamburg, Germany 1945, after years of pounding by Allied heavy bombers. But this destruction wasn't the result of aerial bombing. Mm -hmm. It was caused by German artillery shells, each one of them loaded by hand, aimed, and then fired, sometimes from a distance of 25 miles. Verdun's a tiny city. Some people would call it a town with only 22,000 inhabitants, then and now. During just one four-month period of the battle, 24 million shells were fired by German and French artillery in the Verdun sector. That's more than two shells every second, night and day. Why was this whirlwind of destruction unleashed on a charming little city like Verdun? By 1916, all hopes of a quick victory for Germany and her allies had been dashed. The armies that had charged through Belgium and much of France in 1914 had been repulsed, and the Western Front had now experienced 12 months of stalemate, trench warfare. The German Kaiser, Wilhelm II, had expected to be in Paris long before this. Falkenhayn, his commander in chief, needed to renew the pressure on the French to crush them. But where and how? It's the answer to that question that makes the saga of Verdun especially poignant and especially sinister. Mm -hmm. Von Falkenhayn planned to fight a battle of attrition, slaughter on a massive scale. His aim, he said, was to bleed France white. But why here? Why if they're done? Situated in northeast France, close to the German border, Verdun had several times in history been a battleground for these two warring nations. Most recently, it was the scene of a heroic siege in the Franco-Prussian War of 1871. Only after Paris had capitulated did Verdun surrender. Falkenhayn knew that if they posed a threat to Verdun, that because of its mystical, almost religious significance to the French, they would defend it come what may. It actually made very little military sense to hang on to Verdun, but he knew that they would. Mm -hmm. And to defend it, they would feed in more and more and more troops. So as long as he kept threatening it, he could simply kill more and more Frenchmen. Verdun was to be the bait in a gigantic trap. Falkenhayn reckoned he could use mainly artillery to pick off the newly arrived defenders in their thousands. His utterly chilling calculation was to achieve five dead Frenchmen for every two dead Germans. That is an incredibly sobering statistic. So again, to kind of tie things together and summarize all the loose ends, so Verdun strategically and militarily was not a significant city like Paris, the capital. But the Germans understood, von Falkenhayn understood that with Verdun, there was this very emotional attachment that the French people felt towards Verdun. And they would defend it no matter what. And that's exactly what von Falkenhayn was counting on. That as long as you kept threatening to, to destroy it and take it over, that the French would keep sending more and more of the soldiers there to defend it at all costs, which is exactly what the Germans wanted. Because again, they wanted, to, they basically said for every, again, two German soldiers that they figured would be killed, they wanted to kill at least five 
French soldiers to bleed France white. Wow. That was a very powerful and very sobering and very poignant, I love that word, and downright very depressing direct instructional Zoomcast, but an important one to understand the horror of war. So at this point, I'm gonna ask everybody, please make certain that you take out your correctable tape, go and clean up anything you crossed out or traced over. There is no crossing out, there's no tracing over. This is again, supposed to be a portfolio of your absolute best optimal effort. Number two, now's the time I want you guys to take out, again, at least two, again, preferably three different colored highlighters. Use different colors to denote different information like guide questions, one color, again, your notes in another color. Remember when you highlight, don't highlight entire sentences. You need to, again, focus on those words you can visualize in your mind, the persons, places, and things. You're not done though. Then you're gonna go back and take 10 to 15 minutes and review this information. If you have an opportunity tonight or tomorrow, hand your ISN to mom or dad or brother or sister that had me. And you channel the interim, Mr. Bonk, and you teach the information. That's the most natural, organic way to truly study and develop mastery of the information. Talk about the key points. Talk about, again, trench warfare. What does it mean to go over the top? What was no man's land? What were some of the weapons of mass destruction that were introduced in World War I and why the casualties were so high? What was the deadliest of all the weapons that were introduced in World War I? What weapon was banned after World War I? You didn't see it in World War II. And then talk about Verdun. Why did the Germans target this quaint little village up in the northeastern part of France itself? Strategically, again, it didn't have the same value like Paris did, which was the capital, but there was an emotional attachment. So psychology and emotions plays a part in this. And what do we mean by waging a war of attrition? A very dark, and I love that word that, again, the way that one narrator described that a very sinister, again, strategy for allowing the Germans to finally break the stalemate. And in their mind, they thought they could win World War I at this battle. So what I will do is for my next Zoom cast, I will finish up the importance of that done. And what I will then do is, and I agree with the one narrator, how, again, you look at what happened at Veda Dunn and what happens at Veda Dunn has an absolute strong connection to what is going to happen at the Battle of the Somme. So I'm going to be talking about the Battle of the Somme on my next Zoom cast as well. So again, I hope you enjoyed this very powerful, this very dark, depressing, Zoomcast live from the Bond Kitchen again. And as I always like to say, as I wrap up every Zoomcast, you know, the story may have ended today, but you better believe that the saga is going to continue tomorrow. And the rest, as we say, everyone is history. Peace out, everybody. Thank you so much. And as always, please be well.